Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves going today with session 11 of 120B, 220B. We have an action-packed agenda for you, continuing with a lot of the structural things we've been talking about and uh, kind of carrying them forward from just thinking about modeling to how we actually start integrating models together in several different disciplines and finally how we can even start doing a little bit of analysis on the models that we're creating. So a lot of cool things to talk about today. Um, as we get going, just some general notes about like uh, where we are in the overall process. In terms of your integrative design projects, oh, what is it now? Is it the fourth week of check-ins? I think it is. But basically, where you should be at this point is pretty much uh, your preliminary design is looking fairly complete and you have the, the major structural framing elements in place. Okay. I'll go ahead and sort of put a caveat on that in that we're going to take a look at several different versions of structural models today at various degrees of completeness. And just for your models and in general as you're working on this for a course where the scope is kind of where we are, um, there's a limit to really how much structural modeling you can do um, given the time available and just kind of the scope of what you have relative to everything else we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, when I say structural framing elements are in place, I'd say it's the major structural framing elements. So, for the most part, we have either columns or walls that are supporting some beams. We have the major beams in place, probably even some smaller beam systems that support the floor plates. But there's really a whole lot of detailed structural engineering and modeling work that you may not have in your model, and that's okay. You know, to really go through and do a very complete model. We'll show you some more complete models today in class. Um, but it, it could take weeks and weeks and an entire quarter's worth of a class or something like that. So especially for people who have either very large buildings, which might be located in Hong Kong, or very complex buildings, which are scattered across the hillside with different types of structures and different systems. Don't worry about doing everything thoroughly and completely. Really, even if you have multiple buildings, think about like one of the buildings and what, you know, as you choose that, don't necessarily choose the most um, structurally challenging, choose the one where it's gonna have a fairly regular form, one that'll be fairly easy for you to predict and ultimately do your modeling. Because, you know, you can always extend and go beyond that, but it's not my expectation. So go ahead and kind of choose the appropriate level and the appropriate scope. But if you have any questions, Ask Alana, ask myself, ask Angad. We'll all give you the same basic story, which is like, scope it down, scope it down, so that you have something that you can feel good about and have some control on, as opposed to just feeling overwhelmed by the sheer size of the task. Okay? So, um, that's where we should be relative to check-ins and what you should be looking at there. Um, there is an exercise hanging around that is due, I guess, this coming Thursday to really go through and for this very basic building form, something even simpler than what we've seen here in class, putting a structural frame into it, whether it's a steel frame or a wood frame or a concrete frame, just to get a little practice with a very rectangular, very kind of regular frame. So please go ahead and get that in. And uh, just again, just to give yourself a little bit of practice working with something simple before you go ahead and try to exercise it on your buildings, which tend to be a little more complex. Okay, in terms of what we're talking about today, there's just a couple of things we want to finish up on because we're going to start moving pretty quickly to start thinking about the mechanical systems and some of uh, you know, the air, the plumbing, the electrical, some of the things that support the functioning of the building beyond the structural skeleton. But in terms of structural modeling and structural loads, one thing I just sort of want to talk about very briefly is, oh, to continue to talk about sort of foundations and lateral load elements, because there's two sort of things that, you know, I don't spend nearly as much time talking about. We always talk about the gravity systems, the columns, the beams, the beam systems. It's those sorts of things. So thinking about these other elements is actually, like, useful just to sort of consider, uh, like, you know, you know, how we would go through and support them and model them appropriately within our systems. Um, let me go ahead and start out with just the gravity or the uh, lateral load systems. We talked about lateral load systems in terms of our goals when we first got started here. The idea being the most common things we have to worry about laterally are either seismic loads or wind loads. And it's surprising, although we're here in Northern California, if things get tall and the wind forces get great, the wind forces will dominate. It's uh, probably the more common condition. But in either case, we sort of designed them in a very similar way. 
Um, what we're trying to do is basically provide elements that will provide some lateral stiffness so things don't just fold over. It's two different things. We don't want them to move sideways. You don't want them to shear off their foundation. You also don't want them to fold over, to collapse if there's a big force that's kind of pushing a frame sideways. So to approach it that way, we tend to either put walls in the place, shear walls, we'll put braces in place, or we'll put some sort of a frame in place. And let me just kind of show you what each of those look like so you sort of get a sense of uh, you know, how that might work. So, oh, to do this, let me go ahead and I'll open up in the world of Revit. Oh, it's, it's the examples from, I believe it was session nine. Let me go and see where they are. I'll go back over to Revit, oh, quick time player. I'll say, let's go ahead and open. And I want a building that's fairly early on in the process. So I'm going to go to, I think it's session nine where I put them. Structural modeling. Yeah, we'll just go ahead and say uh, simple building shell. Actually, let me go through and do this. I'll put the first four columns and beams. I can even put the beam systems in there. Yeah, let me go for that. I'm going to go for 3B. It already has the beam systems in place. So at some level, this may look something like your building right now in terms of basically having some columns, having some beams, having some beam systems to support the floor. This is really about the place we would expect you to be kind of on your building. There's still some interesting things going on in terms of the roof and other things that haven't been done yet. But let me go ahead and start talking about just the lateral systems using this as a model. Okay, let me close that up. Come back over here. So the idea is, if we think about this building and even this row of columns that is uh, supporting the second floor right now, if we actually apply a lateral load to the building, okay, we might actually have a problem. So if we went through and we applied a lateral load, oh, just kind of right here at the second floor level, the problem is, although we're supporting things very, very well in terms of a gravity standpoint, we're keeping them from falling down on the ground, we don't have a lot of lateral support. This is actually a big problem we had with a lot of buildings that collapsed during earthquakes. But, I mean, a lot of them here in California as well as around the world. What happens is when you have a building which is supported on little thin columns like stilts, what tends to happen is, is as you push sideways, the columns just start tilting over to the side. Okay, and eventually, you have a collapse where the whole thing just leans sideways. And that's really what we call by, it's really sort of an empty level. There's a missing level to the building. This is a very common condition. We used to build a lot of apartment buildings on top of garages. And we just have all these like little stick columns kind of poking down in the garages. So you'd have a problem where they would collapse during earthquakes. That whole infill level would just sort of like fold over. So we're going to go through and try and prevent that. And the ways we can go ahead and try to prevent that are multi-fold. We've got to provide something that's going to prevent the thing from moving sideways. So there's a couple of major ways we can approach that. Okay. The first way I'll think about preventing it is to put some sort of a wall element, a very stiff wall element, which might kind of uh, resist the lateral forces. If you do that, we can think about adding what's called a structural wall. So if, for example, I came on down here and said that between column line oh, 02 or 03, wherever this is, I'm going to go through and put a wall in here. Okay. Now, for my different wall types, I probably don't want one of these kind of like very basic walls that are just more architectural. Okay. I probably want to go through and put in some sort of a structural wall. And the difference between a structural wall and a non-structural wall is fairly straightforward. Let me go through, I'm even going to create a new concrete wall. That foundation one has sort of a special attribute associated with it that makes it a little bit grunky. So I'm going to instead going to duplicate this. I'm going to call it concrete wall eight inches. Go ahead and give it a nice material like cast in place concrete. Let's see what I got in here. Super. Say OK. We got this fantastic clean wall. It has its thermal properties. It understands that. It understands its thermal mass, all that type of stuff. 
At this point, though, it's not necessarily structural. Even though concrete, you know, typically could handle some structural loads, we're going to basically designate whether or not the wall that we put in place should be uh, considered as part of the structural system or if it's just a concrete wall serving an architectural purpose. So how we do that is we're going to go ahead and draw the wall just like we would normally. So here's my wall. It's going to go right from here over to here. That part's fine. The thing that makes it structural is if you choose the wall, there's a checkbox right here. And that is the key choice. If that checkbox is turned on, it'll be considered structural. When we take it to analysis, that wall will be considered part of the analysis. If it's not, even though it's concrete, it won't be. Notice that as we turn it on or off, we get a couple different choices. We have the choice here under structural usage. Is it a bearing wall? Is it a shear wall? Or is it a combined shear and bearing wall? OK, and that just really means, is it going to uh, factor into the gravity analysis, the lateral analysis, or will we be considering both load cases on it at the same time? OK, so you get to sort of choose how it will be analyzed. If it was going to be a shear wall, I'd do it that way. I could have walls which are providing shear but not providing any gravity support. Okay. or kind of the combined case together. In this case, oh, since I have the uh, columns kind of all around it and the beams, I'll say that it's not going to carry gravity right now. Notice also it's giving us a little bit of information here about the rebar cover. This is going to get more into doing steel design in terms of figuring out if we're going to place a lot of rebar in this, you know, how much clearance we should have on each side away from the reinforcing bars. Okay. Now, doing the design of the rebar is it's well beyond the scope of what we're going to do here, but you can do it. You can go through and sort of say these are the locations where the rebar is going to appear, sort of indicate if there's some sort of ties, and really go through and do very detailed modeling of where all the steel elements are going to be, okay, and then ultimately carry that through to fabrication, which might be a really good thing to do. But we're not going to go that deep. Okay? So I'm going to put that steel wall in there. Or say OK. Let's go through and take a look at this. It's actually probably hiding right behind here. Okay. Now let's talk about this. That little wall, which is hiding right within there, okay, is actually going to be very useful providing lateral support. Can you imagine that if I did go through now and put a big old load heading in this direction, okay? that lateral wall, that uh, concrete wall might resist the folding over effect. The concrete could actually, as a large plate, go through and just resist all that. Okay, and that's really what we're trying to basically get at is that we can go through and use it in that structural way. Now, just to make a comment about structural walls versus non-structural walls, notice in this view, my coordination view, all the walls are showing up. So I got my walls and I hid some, I have the curtain walls, I have all these different things kind of floating around. If I change it over to be a structural view, okay, oh, it's interesting. I have them turned on in the structural views. The other walls disappeared, but that wall stayed around. Basically, there's this whole notion that even if you go through it in your architectural model, put in some walls that you designate as structural, they'll show up inside your structural model too. And the ones you typically do that are the ones that are around your building core. If you have an elevator or you have a stairway shaft, typically those are the ones that are also going to be serving a structural purpose. So, you know, the concrete's provide, you know, it's providing sort of, you know, structural reinforcement laterally. It's providing fireproofing. It's doing a lot of good things for you. So there's a reason why we make all our cores, but we tend to make them out of uh, concrete. Okay, so this system's going to work perfectly okay. Yes, Henry. Um, so in practice, will there be any detailing embedded in the columns and the concrete, or is that fine? Say again? So will there be any like, uh, connection between the column and the shear wall? Oh, exactly. Now, well, it, it sort of depends. It depends on how you want to design the structure. You know, in this sort of thing, typically what you would do is you would have that concrete tied to a foundation and you'd have at the top of the concrete, you'd have some sort of studs that tie it to the diaphragm above. Okay. And then the diaphragm stays in place. Therefore, the columns stay in place. But it kind of depends on how composite you want to make your structure. 
that's the way you typically think about doing something like this is, you know, even like if we'll, we'll talk in a moment about like a moment frame, what you'll typically do is, you know, you basically try to stabilize the diaphragm, okay, which in this case is the big floor slab above it, okay, and then everything else should stay. If that in turn affixes the top of the columns, you don't get some sort of a weird compound uh, structural effect, but something to think about. Now, this wall that's hanging around in here um, could and should have a little bit of a foundation underneath it because although we would like it to stop moving at this point, if it's just kind of skidding along the mud, it wouldn't uh, really do very much uh, good for us. So we'd like to put a little foundation underneath this. So how we do that is, oh, under structure, we have the option of going through and putting isolated foundations in there. Let's go ahead and pull those in there. I'll do my structural foundations. Oh, I'll just put in that rectangular footing. And this is the one where typically, if only we're concerned about gravity loads, we can go ahead and put a foundation here. I can put a foundation under this one. I could put foundations under this. I have to control click. Okay, but these foundations, the ones that I've put in here, those are really all about just resisting the gravity loads and kind of worrying about how those are carrying down to the ground. So what I'm gonna do is actually add something else to the picture. I'm gonna first just bring down the section box so you can see everything. Okay, so those are supporting my gravity loads. Those are kind of okay. In terms of that load, I not only want to sort of support it from gravity, but I also want to sort of give it a support so that it's affixed to the earth and it's not going to skid along relative to the earth. You want to sort of create a bond between the bottom of that wall and the earth. So what we often do to our walls is we'll come through and put in what's called a wall foundation. And a wall foundation is just you choose a profile. In this case, it's 12 inches tall by 36 inches wide. We choose the wall we want to put it on. And you see what it did right there. In fact, maybe I'll even take out these foundations so you can sort of see better what's going on with that wall. Very often what we'll do is kind of have a hybrid of the two. We'll have kind of a big pad at the ends for carrying the column loads, and then we'll put this down so that the wall foundation is just supporting the wall. Now, this wall can really be doing all sorts of stuff for us, kind of like uh, Henry was alluding. I'm going to hide the floor for right now. Because, oh, at the top of this wall right now, I actually do have a beam that's kind of hiding inside of there, but there's really no reason for that. If you want to go through and use the wall to also go through and support uh, the gravity loads, you can take that out. Okay. And just have the wall actually providing support for the floor above it. And that's probably the more common way you do this. If you're going to put a big old concrete wall in there, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to double up. And it's kind of like the belt and suspenders thing. Maybe you can, but it'd be more common to just sort of think about something like this. Even in a case like this where you have the big old concrete wall in there, what you'd probably do is, as opposed to going through and just putting the steel beams in there, it really depends on the magnitude of the loads, okay, you could go ahead and just extend the wall so the wall goes farther out. And as you do that, what's going to happen is it's quite okay for these beams to tie into the concrete wall. You'll put some sort of a pocket at the end that's going to hold them. We could put a metal bracket that we're going to somehow affix to the wall, whether it's by bolting or welding it to a plate on the concrete. We'll do something, but you know, you start putting walls in, like uh, you don't need to do everything. You sort of could like uh, let that do a lot. Now, in this case, if I am going to use it as a wall like that, I'll say, great for the wall. It's not only providing shear now, it's doing both. It's doing gravity and shear at this point. Okay, but notice as I stretch the wall on out, you know, the wall footing sort of extended. 
that I want to make the footing bigger, if I decide that there's really a very intense load on this that's being carried down and I need to make it a bigger footing, what I'll typically do is just sort of size it all up. That's a kind of smallish one. If I really needed a bigger one, I could say that, great, let me duplicate this, and it's going to be 48 inches by 18 inches. Super. But the more common thing is that if you, you don't have a continuous line of load, which is very heavy, you probably will see smaller kind of footings like that. And what will just happen is at the points where the columns come down and put the very concentrated loads, you'll go back and you'll have these isolated footings mixing with the, uh, the, uh, the wall footings. And that's OK, too. OK, so one way of doing lateral loads is to go through and think about this wall. Okay. Right now, this wall is providing fantastic support for that second floor. How about for the roof? Does it do anything for the roof? So I got that shear wall. It's providing support for the second floor diaphragm to prevent it from moving. Is it helping the roof at all? Brittany says no. How would Brittany uh, make it help the roof? Good idea. I like that. I'll go with that. So I could extend this all the way up to the roof, which is a very common thing to do. It probably even makes sense for me to do something where I'm going to attach it to the bottom of the roof. Okay, now it's supporting both those diaphragms. Now, there's all sorts of funny rules to get into. It really gets into the steel detailing here about what the ratio of how tall versus how wide it should be. In concrete, you could put an awful lot of reinforcement. You could do most anything you want to. If I was looking at this and doing this with wood panels, and you can do it with wood panels as opposed to uh, with concrete panels, you know, there's sort of a rule of two high to one wide that you try to stay less than. You don't like it to get taller than two times two to one. Okay. So if you need very tall, what you'll need to do is actually spread it out some more like that. Okay, just to sort of help with that. But Let's just go ahead and sort of see if you can sort of uh, uh, check out some examples. I'll show you some examples of uh, what this looks like. Plywood shear walls. I do an awful lot of residential construction. And in residential construction, if we have a lot of wood framing, what we'll do is, oh, we'll often cover the whole outside of the building with sheathing with plywood sheathing that looks something like this. Okay, and the key to sort of making something, plywood's very good laterally, to make it a good shear wall is it just all comes down to the nailing and how often we nail it into the studs and stuff like that. So if you see a lot of plywood all over the building, it's providing two different functions. Part of it's to sort of provide a backing for the siding, but also part of it's to provide some lateral reinforcement. But you'll find out that Sometimes you can't always get as much of a plywood opening as you would like to, go, or a covering as you would like to. Very often in modern architecture today, we have big old holes that are uh, preventing you from covering the entire thing with plywood. We like our glass. We like our big sweeping views and stuff like that. So there are some other technologies which are useful to sort of make this happen. Okay. What we can do, actually, oh, here's an interesting one. This is an old building right there. You see that little uh, diagonal brace? Okay. In older buildings, that's the way we did that. We put little diagonals running through the building. And that was kind of OK. It wasn't as good as putting plywood all over the entire building. You might see in this building, what we have is we have all these horizontal boards, like shiplap siding of some type. They'll provide some lateral reinforcement, but if you can imagine, they actually do slide past each other. They're not really good for preventing that. So they put in these little diagonal braces, and that would often help. Yeah, it wouldn't do as good a job as we would like, but that's the way we sort of did it. Let's see what I have over here. That's just a little temporary brace that's in there. Nah, that's nothing too special. Okay, but let's talk about what the equivalent of that is. So. Let's come back over to Revit for a second. 
Okay. If we didn't want to have a big old wall going all the way up, there's other ways of going through and providing this too. Well, actually, before we change that, let's talk about where you need to provide this, because that's kind of a good issue too. I think some of my friends in structure courses may know a little bit about this. So, if I go through and I look at this wall right over here, I have a shear wall right there. Okay, is that shear wall going to be sufficient for the entire building? Let's talk about the forces on the building. So, for example, if I have lateral forces and they're heading in this direction, is that shear wall over on the right hand side going to take care of everything? I see a no shaking in the second row. And Ms. Jacqueline, why is that not going to take care of everything? You are absolutely correct. If you have it all pinned on that right side, but there's nothing pinned on the left side, if you can picture the whole building is going to try and rotate around that right side. So what we tend to like to do is come up with systems that are sort of symmetrical. So if you're going to put one on this side, I like to put one over on this side. And you'll actually find that we tend to split it and kind of keep it very nice and even. We like symmetry because if, whenever you have e or un asymmetry, you have eccentric loads and like uh, things try to pivot around and that's not a good thing. So this will tend to work. Now, if we think about that floor diaphragm all the way across and this is being supports for it, if you really want to think creatively, you could think of the floor diaphragm as though it's a big horizontal beam. So I have all these loads coming this way. And what actually determines whether or not those two end conditions are enough to go ahead and support the whole building? Like if this were a beam and you put a uniform load on it like that, what would happen? How would the floor plate try to deflect? So picture this as a simple beam. This is one end of the beam. This is the other end of the beam. If this were a simple load, a kind of uniform load all the way across, like what would happen to the floor plate? If it were a beam, so currently it's like this. What happens to that shape as the load's applied? Anyone? Henry, I know you're thinking. What are you thinking? What's that? Well, actually, <laughs> in this case, it would do that, because it's pushing in that direction. <laughs> oh, very good. It's a sad smile. So the simple beam will start deflecting there, so we might have a problem sort of uh, with the deflection right in this point. So if the building gets very, very long, you may decide that, hey, I want to put a little bit of support somewhere in the middle. So somewhere in here, I'll go through and put some intermediate support. And what you're doing there, like if that is my uh, building core, is you're basically bracing the beam in the middle. Okay, so you're eliminating or you're uh, minimizing the deflection across the whole thing. So now I have half a sad face. It's just going to go from uh, here to here, and then here to here. But it won't be as much as a big, long, continuous beam. Okay, so it is true that we tend to put them on the outside edges and we try to put them symmetrically. But let's think about this. In terms of the loads that are coming, do earthquake loads always come in the same direction? So I got my earthquake load over here. And I have my earthquake load coming in this direction. Okay, and so I put some resistance from it over here. And I put it over here. But how are we at telling earthquakes which direction they should come from? Do we have control over this? No, sadly. So we need to think that the loads might also come from this direction too, or that direction. Could be either way. So we end up typically having to go through and put in sense of shear roll over here and some sort of shear wall over here too. Okay, so we need lateral resistance on all sides is really the upshot of all that. Okay, 
Now, with that as really a fundamental way of starting to think about it, let's go back to 3D and consider how we're going to do this. Okay, so per the Brittany suggestion, this is looking pretty good. My right side looking a-okay, so I'm not too worried about that. I'm going to imagine the, the left side I might be able to do something very similar to on the other side. Okay, so that should be okay. But let's talk about uh, how we get into some of the other dimensions. On the back of the building over here, for example, I could go ahead and put a shear wall in there, but there's other ways of doing it. If I don't want to use concrete, I could actually use a little bit of steel to do this. And that's probably another very common way you see this. In fact, if you've recently been over to the Wong Center, which is one of my favorite places to hang out. Let's see if I can find it. That's, oh, that's gravity. I don't want to look at gravity. You'll see these things. And you might wonder about those things that are kind of floating around in there, invading our architectural space, but those are all lateral braces. This one's kind of turned sideways. But you see there's diagonal bracing, bracing each of the different floor levels, going all the way up to the top of the building. And if we were going to go through and do something similar to that in our building, what we could do is come back over here and say, hey, I would like to put in some lateral braces. Like that. Okay. Chances are, though, again, I would like to go through and carry them all the way up to the top of the building. So I'm going to grab these things. I'm going to go through and paste them on up to, where is it? I think they're on level three, but again, I'll be proven wrong. Yeah, not too bad. So I could do that. And that's a very common way, again, of going through and supporting that. So we don't have to put them both in place. In fact, you typically have one system or the other. Decide whether you're sort of a steel bracing system or you're more of a kind of concrete shear wall system. But if you want to do bracing, not to worry, under structures, There's the bracing tool. The bracing tool lets you choose some different sizes. This will only have the sizes of framing that are available. So since it's only 12 by 26 in there right now, it's going to be a fairly messy connection. If I loaded in some tube steel, that might be a smaller beam. It might be a little better looking. Let me show you what I mean. With the 12 by 26s, I'll go from, oh, let me turn on 3D snapping. I'll go from the base of this column to, it's always a little work to find the midpoint. I'm not sure that is the midpoint, if that's the end point. We'll find out. I think it isn't. Because it's sort of penetrating up in there. Let me try this again. I'm going to get rid of that one for right now. What I want to do is put that brace in, in a way that I want to find the midpoint of this beam. Oh, there it is right there. And now go down to there. Now again, you may be saying, that's an ugly looking connection. Henry knows that's not gonna happen because we're gonna go through and put some sort of a steel connection both at the bottoms of the columns and actually do something to clean up the joint at the top. Again, that's something we typically do in Revit after the fact. You know, for the initial modeling, we often do leave it this way. It's just kind of quicker, it's less computationally intensive, just leave it hanging this way. When you do want to go through and connect it, oh, we'll do something where, for example, we use this funny coping tool where, and I always get the order of this one wrong, it's coping and I never remember, do I take this and cope that? Nope, it's the other way. It's I take that and I cope that. And kind of make it look a little bit better. Now, it won't just be there. There'll be some sort of plates and some welding and something to hold it all in place. That's fine. 
But the other thing you can do is just even if you load in some uh, smaller elements, let me go ahead and insert and load in. Oh, from my structural framing. I'll just do a little steel. Um, what do I have in here? Well, um, hollow steel sections. Got all sorts of sizes in here. In general, I don't load a whole lot of sizes at once because it just sort of slows things down on the machine. I can load in a couple sizes. Some 4 by 4s Maybe I'll get a 6x6. Six six. Some 5x5s. Five 5s five fives by 3s. 6 by 3. I got some sizes. Okay, so with those new improved sizes in place, I can go through and choose and say, instead it wants to be a piece of tube steel, which is a little more elegant. But this strategy will work just fine. The cool thing is, if you are good at sort of placing your geometry and you've placed that geometry at the first floor and your first floor is looking accurate, you can, the same way you copied the columns and beam up there, you could copy this and paste it aligned to level three. Oops, now that didn't work. They pasted a line to, it's interesting, beams and columns go to the level above it. Looks like the uh, braces sort of belong to the level where it was originally placed. Uh, or at least, well, I, hate, I hesitate to generalize. There you go. So you can do that. So bracing is a very popular strategy too. You see that in an awful lot of buildings here on campus. We brace things, it's a very efficient way, especially for steel construction. Let's talk about this. If you have concrete, do you need to put braces in like this? Not typically. Okay, how is the lateral reinforcement handled in the concrete beam and column systems? Because the um, reinforcement is usually in two both ways. Yeah, oh fantastic. Now, so what ends up happening is in that concrete system, Oh, where is that? Let's go back to, it's probably an eight. What'll tend to happen is right there at the joint, we put a lot of reinforcing that bends from one to the other and really tries to make that a very stiff corner. We really just try to stiff it out right there in terms of providing the lateral reinforcement that should be in there. But in steel frames, it's often harder to do that, so we'll go through and put the braces in. It tends to be a less expensive strategy for doing it. So we'll end up with these big old steel braces. So, big old steel braces are A-OK -okay most of the time, but some people don't like them. The, about the only time people really sort of kind of balk about your steel braces is, oh, see if I can grab the wall there. Looks like I got the whole panel. Hmm. Ba -ba -ba. What I want to show you is just bringing that sheer wall or that wall across the front. So some people don't like that when you have the braces hiding behind your uh, curtain walls. A lot of times we do see that though. That's more and more we're getting used to seeing structure and kind of celebrating and saying it actually looks okay. But some people are a little bit hesitant about doing that. So there's another strategy we'll use sometimes as opposed to putting the braces in. And let's see if we can sort of demonstrate it here. Well, I'll just put a beam across the top so we can sort of get a sense of what it might look like. Set out a very good looking beam. Make that a little bit bigger. Okay. We can come up with something which is called a moment frame. And a moment frame is really not all that different from another type of uh, fabricated steel. What happens in the moment frame connection is, as opposed to in the corners having everything, everything bolted together, where bolted connections tend to be very good at transferring shear loads, but they're not so good at transferring moments, okay? We actually weld that together. So let's see if we can actually come up with some examples to give you a picture of what that looks like. 
So, and let's say steel, let's say bolted frame connection. So these are very common. This is the sorts of thing that are where we're taking some different steel members, we're bolting them all together, and we're kind of connecting it in a you know, fairly simple way. We go ahead and put all these bolts in place to hold everything together. That's really good about preventing things from moving up and down, from shearing, but it's not so good at preventing moments from being transferred. Because what would happen if we tried to sort of twist, those bolts will try to pull out. They're good at shearing, but they're not meant to be sort of pulled on instead. So. Let's try another kind of example. Oh, there's lots of pictures in here. What's going on? Just all these bolted connections. That's kind of the most common way we do things. This is strictly bolted. This one's kind of interesting. This has a little bit of welding right here. Let's talk about that. If I put a little welding in the equation, then all of a sudden I start having the ability to transfer shear or a moment across too. Okay, because the plate is taking care of transferring the shear. The welding's actually making it as one so that if I try to twist, it'll also twist on the column and the column will resist the twisting. So this is kind of a really simple example, but let's go ahead and find you a better example, which is if I go out and say a moment frame connection. Let's see what we have in here. This is one that's actually buckled, but it's sort of a good example of what tends to happen. What we try to do is basically go through and weld this together, and when we do weld it together, we'll often have it to put plates behind where the welding is to go through and really like build it up so that we have extra, I guess, support there to uh, kind of what transfer the loads, transfer the uh, lateral loads. Let me come back again, that again. So I want to get a better picture of that for you. Let's see, do I have anything in here? Usually the way I can spot them is just really an awful lot of welding that happens at the corners. Here we have many different things going on. We have a gusset plate, which is holding the brace. We have the bolting. We also have the welding going on in there. And oh, here's one. This is very much like a if you check out the new building, that's where the daily used to be, where the Stork Press building used to be. It's near Terman Beach, or something like that. They're building a new building there. It has all welded frame connections. So if you kind of check out this connection, you'll notice there's not a whole lot of bolting going on at the corner. What's going on is I have one piece kind of framing into another piece with these plates behind it and a whole lot of welding there in the corner. What that's doing is actually creating a frame. It's creating something that's not just a column, it's not a beam, but it's going to be considered one big structural element that will provide the lateral support. And the way we model that in Revit, if you want to think about doing something like that, is to, oh, when you choose the elements over here, you say, OK, we got all this different sort of information about the connections. That's kind of fine, but I don't see anything about really, you know, the connection between the beam and the column and really what that's going to look like. And the reason is, well, actually, we do have a little bit in here in terms of the connection here. Is it a shear column connection or a moment column connection? Okay. Although that's mostly just passing information about like, uh, oh, you know, what we sort of envision that to be more in a database of where we think the moment connections are going to be versus just the shear connections. But let me show you how you can actually get to it. In this model, okay, we can actually turn on something called the analytical model. And the analytical model we haven't played around with very much, but it's hiding behind all this. If I say visibility graphics, and I say show the analytical model categories, you'll see that we have those lines, those orange lines, the blue lines. These are the structural lines of the columns and the beams. And if you choose the column line, okay, in here, you can go through and say something about the end connection. 
Is it a bending moment connection? Is it a fixed connection or a pin connection? Okay, and this will get transferred forward into the structural analysis software. So if you want to consider those to be a bunch of bending moment connections that are fixed because you want to consider that as part of your structural analysis, it'll kick in and do it. Okay, so that's deeper than I really want to get into all that, but at a high level, the important thing is to know you got a lot of options in terms of doing this. And the way it basically works is, oh, there's kind of an order to kind of the cost of doing these things and how neat and clean the connection details are, where if you go through and think about putting in braces or something like that, that tends to be a relatively inexpensive way, but it has an architectural impact. If you think about doing moment frame connections, it's very neat and tidy, it's very good looking architecturally, but it's very expensive to do something like that because there's an awful lot of fabrication work and kind of upsizing of the members in order to accommodate all that. So uh, you get choices about how you want to do that. Now, I'll show you one last picture just to kind of complete the lateral story. You might remember over in my boring old world of residential construction, which is a whole lot of plywood all over surfaces. You know, we also have the desire to go through and have very high tech connections that can transfer a lot of lateral loads with very little uh, material because we'd like to keep things open and have good open, you know, big window openings, big clear openings. So there's a very cool system that gets used, which I'll show. It's called a Hardy frame. The Simpson Company also has some of these. Let's see if I can pull this up. Can you see those little steel columns right here and there? And what that is, is doing a little bit of a hybrid structure. You're basically putting a steel panel in the middle of the wood frame. That steel panel will be bolted to the ground, and it'll provide the lateral stiffness in the wall of wood. So if you don't have enough uh, space to put plywood all over, you can put these steel panels in to go through and get just very good stiffness in a very small amount of space. So a very common application of that is things like this, where you have like garage doors. If you think about your average garage, there's very little wall compared to the total size. It's almost all this gigantic door. So you'll see these little steel panels kind of showing up on the sides. And that's what they're all about. They're just really there as lateral reinforcing panels. So we don't use them everywhere. Again, it's a more expensive technology, but you know, I, the way I'd approach this is to say that you know, when you need the better solution because you have a specific requirement, you know, it's available. It's just all sort of a matter of cost in terms of making it happen. That's a slightly different picture. That's a very small picture. See so if we can come up with a bigger one on that. And that's really just it. You can see that one. That's a little steel panel. That's a steel panel that's 32 inches wide. Oops. That's the whole Hardy Frame installation catalog. But we also have them that are sort of intermediates. There's one 32 inches wide. You know, that'll go ahead and provide the equivalent of something like eight feet of plywood in like 32 inches, which makes it a very attractive uh, trade-off if you want to try and keep things very, very open. Okay, so enough of all this in terms of thinking about how lateral systems sort of start playing in. But as you're considering your structures, go ahead and be thinking about where your lateral support elements are. What we'll do is as we're meeting and talking about your structures and you know, we'll show us our, our, the frames and sort of like uh, how you're supporting the gravity loads. I think don't necessarily model it all in complete detail, but at least be thinking about at a high level where you would put the, the lateral supports. And the typical thing is on the outside walls and all the sides in a very balanced way. Okay. That could be very tricky, especially if you have an all glass structure that has an unusual form or something like that. But yeah, there's, there's schemes or there's, there's ways of approaching it for everyone. Okay, so, okay. Let's just pause there for a second in terms of uh, just thinking about the lateral systems and all that. Um, are there general questions? I know we last time sort of looked at some specific questions on some people's projects. Are there general questions about the lateral or the uh, the structural framing systems and how to approach it for your projects, or because yeah, you know, we can talk about them individually. But if you think there's something that's kind of something that a lot of people might be concerned about, throw it out there. Like Henry, you're thinking. What are you thinking? Um, so, what was the difference between the, the fixity at the end of the beam and the fixity by clicking on the elliptical line? Ah, 
In terms of the fixity that's uh, being indicated here, I believe that doesn't actually have an impact on the structural analysis. So you're putting something in there really almost as a designation about you know, whether, well, same thing here, it's whether it's moment passing there or shear passing down here. It's basically what you want to put there. And I think it really is more just in terms of how it's going to represent it graphically in the model. So the things that are just in the structural model spatially are really more about just designating it and keeping a database of the information. Whereas as soon as we go over to the analytical model, So you have the money to change both the field. Yeah, so or really, yeah. So one is changing it from the standpoint of you're trying to keep track of it as a database. The other is changing it from the standpoint of you want to be including it as part of your analytical, uh, you know, your structural analysis. Okay, so if you have it as a shear in your database and fixed, you know, like, I mean, you have to manually know. Exactly, I think, I think you can get those two things out of sync with each other. I'm not 100% certain, but I'm pretty certain you can. That'd be a good one, or you might even imagine doing something where, just as an error check to help uh, people who are modeling st structural steel, you know, you could come up with some sort of a plug-in that would go through and connection by connection, kind of check to see that the two values were in sync with each other and alert you to cases where the analytical model and what the spatial model are saying don't agree with each other. So that could be a good little fix-it sort of plug-in. Okay, so questions about our approach, or how are you guys feeling about your structures from your standpoint? Are you, I know, I've seen many people's structures, I haven't seen yours yet, so like, uh, how's, your, how's your structure feeling, or is it, is it sort of evolving as we speak? It's, it's going. It's going, <laughs> okay, so when do we meet this week? We'll, we'll, we'll push it along. Okay, that, that's good. Uh, Britt, how are you doing on yours? The circles all of a sudden, how are you approaching that? Are you doing like a radial system or how do you guys sort of approach it? I don't know, I was thinking of doing like a, you can set it up so that the grids are along certain parts. Yeah. And then kind of like in the middle nature, it's going to need to be some sort of like a ring or something around. I think it's probably. Like columns and yeah. concrete. That would actually work. Okay, no, yeah, I think you're approaching it right. <laughs> okay. So let us do this. How about this? It is 2.30 right now. Can we do this? Can we take a break for five? When you come on back, we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about if you have structural and architectural and soon some other models, how we get them all together okay, into a coordinated model and look at that online. And also we'll start looking at the whole issue of how we can uh, go through and uh, start doing analysis on these. You'll want to actually think about on your building some small portion where we can do some sizing of the members. It won't be a complete structural analysis, but for some little piece, we'll go through and, you know, for your giant 80 foot span, we'll figure out like how big does that beam really have to be? Okay? So, okay, let's go ahead and break. Come on back in five, and we will shift gears.